Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast. My name is Jonathan, and this is episode 20, Agricola and the Second Century Accommodation. 77 AD, or possibly 78 AD, Gnaeus Julius Agricola is given command of the province of Britain. Most of Wales and southern England are pacified, but on his arrival, Agricola faced the last remaining Welsh holdout, the Ordovice. He decided, unlike so many others before him, to immediately sally out as he arrived, which was considered to be quite shocking, mostly because of the time of year, it being close to the time when campaigning stopped. And so the fact that he decided to do this became important. As well, the Ordovice had destroyed an, a Roman cavalry auxiliary, which, as we said last week, were used to try and flank enemies and also used to go in areas where the troops couldn't necessarily form up and, and take their usual uh, military rankings that they would do under normal Roman attacks. So they would use the cavalry to try and deal with this. And likely it was the fact that the cavalry was up into the mountainous areas of Wales that got them into trouble. And the Ordovice swooped in and slaughtered them. So Agricola comes in at that point, takes command of the legions. Tacitus basically describes the situation as creating bad morale in the local population, as well as creating concerns that those who were hoping for the Romans to slip up uh, were watching very carefully. Um, And again, keeping in mind that Tacitus is not a bystander here. He's not someone who's writing from a purely academic standpoint. He has a dog in his fight. Agricola is his father-in-law. He's writing a eulogy of him. So as all eulogies are, it's meant to be an honoring of the person. So you're not going to get the problems. You're not going to get the, the, the defeats or the bad omens or the bad situations. You're going to get the best and most positive things. So this is one of those situations. Agricola, within that year, wipes according to Tacitus, wipes out the Ordovice. Now, that can mean a number of different things. As we know, even when they wiped out the Jewish population in Judea, there were still Jews there after the fact. So the reality of it is, likelihood is, is that they destroyed the capacity of the Ordovice to resist rather than they actually destroyed the entire tribe outright, which is still a major deal. It still means that there are probably hundreds of casualties, hundreds of slaves that were taken captive. You know, the ability, as I said, of the of the tribe to fight back is now defeated. And much of this has created a very peaceful situation, I guess, for the Romans because they've dealt the final blow. And at this point, uh, Agricola decides to head north. Now, as we said before, the Ordovice typically were contained in the Mid-Wales mountain regions. Uh, the Deca Angli were in the northern regions covering the top of Wales. But Anglesey, which had been invaded previously under Polinus, uh, remained f- apparently free of the final attacks by the Romans. Now, the way they described it previously under Tacitus is that, ta- that they had actually wiped out the druids in that area so what was the resistance that was bothering the romans enough that agricola felt it necessary to go take them on was it a case that they actually hadn't wiped out the druids and there was still druidic resistance there he doesn't talk about that in fact he talks very little about what they did is there a situation where there was raiders that were coming i mean anglesey is an island most easily used to put raider traffic and pirates so you do wonder if maybe some of that was going on the other question is were there irish people that were crossing over into anglesey and putting pressure on the local population there's a number of different things that we just don't know the answer to in this situation but whatever the reasoning was uh they go back to anglesey and they defeat whatever resistance is there and win the final battle and for all intents and purposes as we said last week finish off the capture of Roman Wales. With the capture of Anglesey, all of the territory that we now, modern people, consider to be Welsh is in the hands of the Romans. And as we said before, if it isn't physically in the hands of the Romans, it's only because they don't really want it or it's not worth the bother. And likely that's the case with most of Wales. After this victory, Agricola then turns his governorship 
into a, a raid to the north after 79 AD, when poss- either 79 or 78 AD, when these fo- possible final battles took place, uh, and Wales is officially added to Roman Britain, we now reach what effectively is the pacification stage. The force of the Roman military, while it still remains in place for a time in Wales, it will start to head towards the northern borders, as we said, and it'll start to move towards the final remaining British populations that are free of Roman control, and those are now mostly in very northern parts of Britain, in England, sorry, and specifically in Scotland. And they will head that direction. So from this point on, you can effectively say that Wales has been dominated from the Roman perspective, pacified, whatever you want to call it. Effectively, it remains after that a place that is just a part of Roman Britain and not separate, not individual. And there is no individuality that we can figure out. So what does pacification from the Roman perspective mean? As we move from the end of the invasion and conquering periods of the first century into the second century, where we start to Romanize the population of Britain. Well, it starts off by the Roman education. How better to teach someone than to teach them the education system that you have? The Roman way to do this typically is to take your aristocrats, typically the kings of tribes and children, and they will then take them to Rome. Whether that king is dead at that point or not is no never mind to the Romans. But they'll bring those children back to Rome. They will then be considered hostages, but at the same time they're being taught the Roman way of life. So they're being acculturated, to put it bluntly. And they do this through literature and other educational ways. They show them the games. They show them the wealth of Rome. You take the young kid to the big city sort of thing. And as we said a few episodes back, that can be intimidating or it could be something that that these children came to love. And so they come back to their new home or their old home and bring the new ideas with them. And so Rome's Pax Romana in some parts is bringing the education system that these children were taught, bringing the language, the writings, the poetry, the culture of Rome, the gods, to your home and investing them in your home. In fact, there's a story in in Tacitus's book Agricola where he discusses that in the uh, aftermath of the final capture of Wales and the uh, the death of Vespasian that Titus's busts suddenly appear everywhere Emperor Titus and that that's how a culture they'd become and it becomes part of the building program that the Romans suddenly institute, uh, where in their building infrastructure and they give the, the credit to the emperor or to the local governor. And so plaques arise, you know, it's, it's the old, it's the, it's the, uh, the large check being handed to the local community as they build the local library and that kind of idea, right? So it's a lot of that kind of thing, the old political rub around to give you a nice treat in order to kind of, A, pass on our ideas and culture and teach you that you just want to be one of us, and B, to help you understand what it is to be one of us. And so, like I said, the education is the first big thing they start to do. All those children at this stage are now coming back, at least from the initial invasions, and more will follow, and they will bring with them the Roman ideas, the Roman religion, the Roman everything. And that in and of itself creates pressure on society. And we know from the Norman times in England that that had a heavy influence on the Anglo-Saxons who were dominated by it. The culture of the Normans was invested into the culture of England and became a part of England. So all of these things make perfect sense. And when you have a dominant military system, a dominant everything, it starts to influence everybody, especially at the higher classes. The higher classes have the most access to the government, the most access to uh, the education systems, most access to wealth. So thus, they know where their bread is buttered. And the reality of it is, if you want to be rich in the Roman system, you need to know how to speak Latin. You need to know how to trade with Latin people. You need to know how to create 
a system that makes it easy for the Romans to purchase items from you. So, you know, your old ways of doing things come to an end at this point. And the other thing is you start to worship the Roman gods because that as well is another big key. You know, when you have deified emperors and they're putting up uh, monuments to them and temples to them, you know, the best way to get yourself in with the new crowd is to act like they do. So you attend the temple, you give worship to the emperor, you offer salvation or sacrifices and libations to the various religious groups of the Romans. You make yourself a part of the community and it comes back on you in financial gain. So these wealthier citizens suddenly are able to take that wealth and turn it into more wealth. And typically they own the land and that's a key point in this. They will own a lot of the land, especially in southern England, where there's a lot more uh, agricultural growth at that time so thus they earned and gained the most so you find loads of evidences of roman villas which are massive mansion-like complexes they go from sort of a small regular sized house as into massive mansions that will spread over wings and and that kind of idea in the second and third century these buildings will become huge as time goes on but and in the initial stage, they always have the basic Roman uh, modern conveniences, for lack of a better word. They have the underfloor heating. They have uh, baths. They have all sorts of things which make them important. And thus, again, Romanize the population because as they have an opportunity to try these things in other places, they want to bring them back to their own place, especially a place like Britain where it's cold, it's rainy, you're spending a lot more time indoors. And so your house is important to you. Obviously, at the lower echelons, in the slave classes, in the very poorest classes, you're not going to Romanize real fast because your life doesn't actually get helped a whole lot by being Roman. In some ways, it might even be more miserable, especially if you're a slave, because all of a sudden, instead of being a slave in Britain, you might be a slave in Syria. You might be a slave in Rome. You might be a slave in Libya. You, all of a sudden, you're in anywhere. You could be anywhere, sent anywhere. You have no control over your life. You could become a gladiator in the arena if you were a warrior. Uh, you know, so a lot of your life got a lot worse. Um, and those people, this is not fun and games. This is not a delight. This is not, you know, ooh, look what the Joneses got. It's time for us to get that. This is, oh boy, I, my life just got worse kind of situation. So, there are bad sides to this as well as good sides to this, and we have to be aware of that. Interestingly enough, uh, the wealth of Rome comes to Wales as well. And in fact, over the 400 years of the Roman control of Wales, they has been found so far to date, well, to date, I say, so far the last major count that was done, which was in 2004, and we know there's been discoveries since then of Roman coins throughout Britain and Wales specifically, but when the University of Cardiff did a proper count in 2004, they found that there was 52,000 Roman coins in Wales, predominantly, interestingly, kept in areas around the south and the north in the co and in the coastal regions. So in other words, the interior of Wales remained relatively Roman coin free. Interestingly, as I mentioned briefly last week, there is a complete absence of these coins on the Llyn Peninsula, which is interesting and may show that that area did not Romanize. And it would also probably be argued that the areas where the Ordovice and others were didn't Romanize terribly well either. So likely they remained very much like their Iron Age predecessors, living in very similar fashion, probably even still in their roundhouses and their hill forts, and really remained relatively unchanged from where they were before. However, to kind of compare this so you understand the difference, in Wales before this, so across the entire Iron Age, there was only 35 coins found. So 35 versus 52,000, it shows you just how different the trade and the economy of Rome is now influencing Wales. Wales is now a part of the Roman Empire, and because of that, it receives all the benefits and all the rewards and all the troubles and all the problems and all the revolts and all the fun stuff that goes along with being a member of the empire. 
as well with that, it becomes a part of the industrial engine of the Roman Empire. Items that were standard in Rome come to Britain. This starts off with the military. The military in Rome is standardized. It's not like most militaries at this point in time where you might have a spear, you might have a sword, you might have a helmet, you might not. You might have a shield. It might be wooden. It might be bronze. It might, you know, your neighbor doesn't look the same as you do when you line up to fight somebody else. You might have a chariot. You might not. All of these things are not standardized, especially in Britain at the time. The Romans come, everything standardized. Your shield, your sword, your helmet, your your armor, your shoes, you know, everything about a military man in the Roman Empire is standardized. And it works because then on an industrial scale, you can build for that, right? I mean, once you have a standard shield, you can make billions of them because you know, okay, I just have to build them this way. The gladius is the sword of the empire. It's short. It's very extremely pointed at the end. It was meant to be a, a thrusting sword as opposed to a, a stab or an over-the-top uh, hitting implement. It becomes something you stab through a shield rather than try and go over top of a shield. Uh, helms are all the same style, same dimensions for the most part. And if you're not one of those, if you're an auxiliary, you also have a uniform and you have a pike and cavalries have their own different outfits, but they're all the same. And you build forts the same way. If you walked into a Roman fort in, say, Carnarvon, and then walked into a Roman fort in, say, Syria, they aren't any different. The layout is identical. So you can always find where the commander is. You can always find where the where you get food. You can always find where the military sleeps. You can always find where the hangers on are. They're, they don't change from place to place. Now, for us in this day and age of industrialization, that's common sense. I mean, it just makes perfect sense that you would have things be the standard. But this is not common in this ancient period. And for a lot of people, this is quite an adjustment. And this idea of the way you build things and the standardization goes as far as to the towns and cities that the Romans are building. The Sivatas, again, maintain a very similar structure from one to another. It's great if you're a Roman because you can go from one end of Roman territory to the other and things are basically the same. You know, people speak more or less the same language of trade. They speak the same uh, ideas. They have similar discussions. They have similar military, similar tax structure, similar administration, you know, it, it, no different than, say, if you lived in Canada, the United States, or any federated state where there's a lot of different provinces and states. Everything is pretty much standardized. There are local variations, but they're relatively standardized. That is the same in the Roman Empire. Things are standardized. You don't have great degrees of variation across the Roman world. There's a reason for that, because it's easy, it's cheap, it's so much more adaptable when you have to move great distances, which they did in the Roman Empire. It was not uncommon to travel, you know, from one end of the empire to another. If you were in the military, if you were in, say, the administrative classes, you would be sent all over the place. Like there's evidence that there were people who may have lived in the Middle East who served in, on the Hadrian's Wall. And all of this kind of stuff is pretty foreign to the world till that point. And so what Rome does is it brings modern ideals to an ancient society that didn't have any of this before. So the adjustment period is pretty huge, but you can see the rewards from it as well. If you can get kind of to grasp with the new way of doing things, you can probably make money on that deal and you can probably make it quickly. So for Roman Britons that acclimatize quite well, this was probably a great thing for them, and they probably made out just fine, thank you very much. For the ones that were lost in the old days, who pined away for the hill forts and the roundhouses, this was probably a disaster, and it was probably felt to be horrible, and they probably thought the Romans were boring and terrible and brought awful ideas and awful things to their lands. So we have to take it in perspective that for some it was great, for some it was awful, for some they thought it was, you know, shocking and terrible. Tacitus often talks about the fact, as I've said before, he moralizes a lot. And one of the things he always moralizes about is he always talks about the way that the ancient tribes and such 
were better off because they weren't corrupted by Roman policies and Roman corruption of money and graft and greed. So, which we can argue about whether there was any validity to what he's saying or not. But the reality of it is, his concept is that the ancient ways were better, is a common theme amongst a lot of people at that time. So it's not going to be uncommon amongst people whose lives may have been turned upside down. Can you imagine if you were a prince or an aristocrat in an old Iron Age Britain society, and all of a sudden now you're basically just the slave or a peasant who's basically working away on a field that he doesn't own? Those kind of people, for their lives, have just been thrown into chaos and destruction if they weren't dead. For other people, you know, maybe it's just the same old, same old. It's a different person taking their money, taking their food. But it's basically the same lifestyle they've lived all their lives. So what's the big deal? So all of this happens, and yes, it makes some major changes. But for some people, it makes no changes. For them, the world is what the world has always been. And you see that kind of thing all the time. You know, there's always people at the end of the day that no matter who's leading, it doesn't make any difference. You know, we were poor before, we'll be poor after. You know, regardless of what happens, our lives were not that great. They ain't going to get any better. That concept and that perception goes on through society. And that is both good and bad. Um, but within that society and within this industrialized, a cultured place, there is room for movement up and down the rungs of the social ladder. So you will see people come out of the woodwork and maybe weren't anything before suddenly becoming commanders of legions, military successes. You know, the, the, the idea, while there is graft and there is nepotism and cronyism in the Roman military, there is also an opportunity to advance yourself and you can become quite wealthy working in the Roman military. So there is an egalitarian side to all this, but nonetheless. So what we see here is the beginnings of the life of luxury as and the so-called modern Roman conveniences. And as I said, the poor see things basically staying more or less the same as it was. And unlike Judea, where, of course, you have monotheism and the idea of worshiping an emperor is a disgusting idea, um, there is none of that in Britain, and they're more than okay with that kind of stuff. So you don't see the conflict over the religious items. In fact, it's very hard to understand what the religious practices were at the time because of this, because there's no outrage. So there's no written documents explaining why this was a bad thing. There's no priests. Now, probably that's because a lot of them have been destroyed with the death of most of the Druids and Anglesey. Uh, it could also be that they had culturalized under the Roman rule and just got themselves called something different. Uh, there's a number of ways that this could have gone. So it's hard to say um, without more writings and without more evidence, we'll never really know. Either which way, it, it is obvious that there wasn't any sort of big flashback against the Roman religious movements. Meanwhile, of course, you have the other part of Roman peace or Pax Romana, which is the legions. And the legions come in and they begin to set up forts. As we said before, there's auxiliary forts, there's bases of operations, there's lookouts, there's proper full-on legionary forts all across Roman Britain. Those forts and roads and everything act in a dual capacity. One, they bring Roman control to your area, but they also help to create a system where if you're trading amongst civatas, or if you're going from one end of Roman Britain to the other, or if you're heading over the English Channel to go sell your wares in Gaul, well, with the Roman legions protecting all these roads, the likelihood of getting robbed and having things go wrong for you are a lot less. <laughs> Will there be graft and greed along the way, people taking their cut? Yes, I, I would argue that's likely the case because we saw that. In fact, there's examples which they talk about, which Tacitus specifically mentions about people having to buy back the grain that they sold to the Romans in taxes, having to then go turn around and buy it all back again in order to feed themselves. So there is greed in there. There is people looking to make a buck. But still, you have now a safer way of shipping goods. So all of a sudden, you can range British wool into the rest of the empire. You can ship 
Roman imperial soldiers, the grain from the fields of Britain. And these kind of things, as well as the bronze and the steel, iron and all that kind of stuff, becomes why Britain is so critical to the Romans and why, even if they didn't know it completely, this becomes a key province for them. Why they don't give it back the way they gave back Dacia and other places. Because at the end of the day, this province will become the breadbasket and the basically the monetary basket for a lot of what comes to the Roman Empire. Rome will make out very well, thank you very much, from this invasion of Britain. In the long run, it will be the key to keeping them up, and it will create its own basket full of problems, as we'll see later, with usurpers and all sorts of fun things. And we'll get to some of those as we talk a little later on, because, as I say, some of them come out of Roman Britain. The final really big thing that we get out of this invasion and the aftermath is Roman engineering. And like I said before, we talked about it. We talked about the roads. We've talked about the forts. But the other thing we start to see under Agricola is larger engineering projects which have nothing to do with military trade or the military movement. They actually become about money and about society and about culture. And some of these things are like baths, which get built, some of which get built on holy sites. The town of Bath, for example, uh, is built on an ancient holy temple. So they took what was already there and then turned it into a Roman idea of that. There is this concept of, of taking the previous and making it something more. And that's one of the ways that they do it. Now, the other thing that they start to do is they create uh, forums. So you find things like in Caerleon, there's a evidence of a forum there where they had games and things. We know in Londinium, they also had these, and they definitely had it in Colchester, which we found evidence for. So they're bringing over the trappings of culture, not just the trappings of Roman military and the trappings of Roman trade. We're also bringing things like the Roman cultural ideas from the poetry to the music to the sports you know, all of those things that are so key come in. And no different in some ways from when the American military ends up on the British Isles during World War II and they stay there quite a long time. And even past World War II into the Cold War, there are military bases for the U.S. there. And what you end up happening is, is it starts to influence the British public. You know, things like Halloween and, and all of this kind of stuff and kind of the Americanization of a lot of things comes about because of that influence and we have similar effects when you have the Beatles for example and the music groups of Britain coming over in the 60s to America they bring a lot of that cultural change and idea to the new community they're coming to well it's no different here all of a sudden we get new sports new cultural things probably mixing in just fine with what already existed because as we've said before one of the levels in the Druidic religion is a bard and bards don't go away. Bards stay in communities long after the Romans. So the musical poetic bard is probably fits quite well in with the Greco-Roman versions of philosophers and poets like Ovid and all of these kind of things that have come from Rome blend in. And you may have bards that are quoting Roman and Greek poetry, as well as quoting their own localized poetry and stories. So all of this kind of combines and you get an acculturation, which within a hundred years almost of the invasion, Roman Britain is unrecognizable from the place that was there before. They're, they're writing, they're carrying on all sorts of different ways of society that are so different and so unique to Britain to that stage that it's unrecognizable from what was there before. Like It's part of the reason why we have such trouble identifying what was there before, because there's just so much Romanness about it. One of the ways that we can tell this is through the dominance of Roman pottery, which becomes everywhere. Roman pottery actually runs across Britain to the point where it is literally, there is as much Roman pottery as there is prior to and after the Roman period, going all the way to the 1700s. In fact, it won't be until the industrial area that we pass the amount of production of pottery that is found in Roman Britain. And one of the big sort of, you know, your corral plate, for lack of a better phrase, 
was something called Samian ware, which is a red clay from, from Gaul, which created into plates and bowls and fancy jugs and things. And, and they're beautiful. They're gorgeous. If you see them, even today, you can see they're magnificent. And they were kind of, you know, the standard dinnerware. They were the China of the era. And so you weren't really somebody unless you had Samian ware. And so it's found everywhere. <laughs> and the thing of it is, once you break a pot, like even a crack, is, as we all know from our plates and our cups, makes them useless. So people just threw them away. And so the evidence of them is much more dominant than it would be elsewhere. And it's not like in the Iron and, and Bronze Age, where pottery is typically being used for very mundane things and burials. These are being used for all sorts of different functions and ways of living. So there's so much that comes in at this point that there's just, it's like the Roman period and then everything else. It's just so amazing to see what a difference it makes. And the evidence is just everywhere. And the reality of it is that's, that's what Rome did everywhere. It didn't just do it here. It did it everywhere. But Britain has a lot of evidence and, and a lot of reminders of this. And we'll talk about that next week. We are getting closer to our fundraiser and to our big charity drive that we're doing right now with Extra Life. We are trying to raise at least a minimum of $1,000 this year for children's hospitals in the United States and Canada. I would encourage you to consider donating. It is such a great cause um, as someone who's benefited from it. I can't thank anybody enough for contributing to it. And of course, we're having a raffle if you donate more than $5 or more. Uh, if you donate $5 or more, we will be raffling off a $25 gift card for Amazon just in time for Christmas for those of you getting thinking that way, uh, or a Welsh history book of a used book of my choice. Um, but we'll show that off in the next few weeks and you can kind of see and make your decision on what you want. But go to distractionsmedia.com forward slash donations and then select your donation hospital you want to donate to. At which point in the message that it gives you an option to fill in, just put Welsh History Podcast Raffle and you'll be entered in. And we will draw that on the 3rd or 4th of December and We'll get in contact with you after that. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate your help listening, your comments, your, your wonderful suggestions. And I hope you all have a fabulous week and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.